Hi everyone, I'm Brian Gurney, I'm a uh, senior software engineer for Red Hat, um, primarily working on block storage things like VDO, Virtual Data Optimizer, and now Stratus, a uh, volume managed file system uh, package. Though during all that storage work I have to do a lot of uh, block storage examination and diagnosis. So first, how many people know what a block storage device is? Okay, pretty good. Most people. Yeah. So a block storage device is a device that's accessed by certain sectors or blocks instead of a, a bitwise uh, fashion. So it's hard disk drives, solid state drives, heaven forbid, tape drives. Um, probably not. Yeah, there's um, hard disk drives can have random access more than tape drives can, and solid state drives are solid state because they don't have to move mechanical arms or anything and so they have better random access performance. So what do block devices do? And so the, the main goal of any storage is to be able to write something down and then read it later. If it fails at that job it's not really long-term storage or long-term memory. Uh, and so the main types of accesses to block devices are classically reads and writes and then later on discards which are a special class for um, things like thin provision devices that provision more space above than they are actually providing below and also devices with uh, some sort of a translation layer between what it presents and what's on the device. Uh, flash drives, uh, NAND based solid state drives, 3D crosspoint, um, like those kinds of drives. When you send, when the initiator sends a discard command, uh, discard request, that tells the device you can free what is underneath that device now, or what is underneath that block now, because the initiator no longer needs it. So then it can do unprovisioning of that block, it can do garbage collection behind the scenes. Uh, for a solid state drives, this is very important for performance reasons. And so, but most applications don't directly access the individual block numbers of a block device. They would have to keep a database of what data goes into what block, whether it can fit into a 512 byte block or it needs more of them, all of that kind of stuff. And then you get into things like fragmentation and the size of that such a metadata database. So most of the time, you have higher level applications than the kernel that create some kind of abstraction to store things on a block device. The most common one is file systems, um, EXT, XFS, uh, the FAT, and Windows side NTFS, things like that, where you can create a file in a folder in a more human readable, less complex to think about a hierarchy where you can store data, not have to worry about how many blocks it goes in, let the file system take care of that. Similarly, object stores provide uh, a way to say this blob of data that is this arbitrary size has this ID and then store it there and then the object storage driver will return and say okay. And logical volume manager is where you don't have to worry about provisioning things ahead of time, you can actually transparently add devices to extend the logical volume and not have to do the migration of data off the old thing where you had to have both old and new devices connected to one system and then manually shuttle data from one to another to make things a lot easier to manage storage devices. So at a basic level programs access blog devices by, via read or write operations which I have here shown by this simple DD command to write a zero block to device NVMe 0 and 1, block size 4096, count 1, I always forget whether it's seek or skip, zero in this case. So it's directly writing a block. And the file system keeps a metadata index of files and their block locations. And there are programs where you can actually find out where, what are the blocks that actually contain this file. And for uh, ext, that's the file frag dash v command, and so you can see block logical offset zero to forty ninety five is uh, 
in this case, this file is uh, 16 megabytes, and so that's it is in four kilobytes, 4,096 blocks of 4,096 bytes. I like how it says that there. It says how big the block is. Um, and so you can see it's on physical arc set 11673600 to 7695. And so the file system takes care of that. Um, but if you had something like a driver reporting that there's some kind of problem with one of those blocks, you may be interested in that. And you have to find out how to get from here to there. And XFS has a similar way where you could say those block ranges, those allocation groups. Um, but then you get into a case where you have some kind of driver reporting an error on block 11677694. Well, what happened? <clears throat> That's the classical question in system administration or diagnosing bugs. And sometimes you need to get to the lowest level to find out what's happening with block 12647, whatever. And so in the block layer in Linux, the, the, the way to do that is called block tracing. And there's uh, two basic programs that are called BLK trace and BLK parse. Usually just say block trace and block parse. And so here's the basics of uh, a block trace. Um, this is the text output from block parse. Uh, the block trace command runs a command on the uh, data on the, the block device and outputs data files. And so block parse will output these columns, and this is a little bit of an eye chart, but uh, the basic columns are which device is it, in this case 8.0, and we can see dev SDA by major minor. What CPU did it happen on? This machine has 24 CPUs in this example. So, uh, and then there's a sequence number per CPU, so then it's monotonically increasing for the individual CPU. What time did it happen in seconds and nanoseconds? Um, and nanoseconds are important for very, very fast devices, like non-volatile NVDIM devices, because they can have latency that approaches hundreds of nanoseconds, or under the tens of microseconds. So that extra precision is really necessary right now. And also, you can see a process ID of who did it, some kind of action of what happened. These comments are actually in the source code for block trace. What happened, who did it, on what CPU did it happen. Um, and so the main core of a block trace is the action and what is called RWBS. And so was, there, was it a read, write, or a discard? And the action is, what stage was that request in? And then there's uh, extended information, which for um, or the sector location, the sector plus offset is standard information. So that will indicate the sector and the, the offset and the length. So the offset from zero, zero would be the lowest block. Um, and then plus 64 would be 64 sectors long. So that would be 32 kilobytes, I believe, yes. So 32 kilobytes for each of these requests. Um, this happens to be a write, a synchronous write. You can tell it from WS. I'll have a decoder card for all of those in uh, slides that are coming up. But as for running block trace itself, um, the basic process for it, which you'll have to have root access, um, if you need to, if the following command fails, run mount dash t debugfs debugfs slash six sys kernel debug. And then after that, you run the block trace command with dash d device on the specific block device you're measuring. If it's a partition, then measure the root block device because you'll want to track what those, uh, remap operations are from a partition to the block device or from a uh, logical volume or a device mapper device, a bio-based device to the actual block device. And then once that's saved, parse the binary block trace files by running block parse dash I. Um, there will be one file for each CPU in the system. So if you have 128 CPUs, there will be 128 files. 
the size of them may vary because some CPUs will get more requests than others. Um, but in the block parse command, only specify the first one, it'll find the rest that have the same common file name. It'll be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, up to 23 in the case of my test system. So that decoder card for all of those actions, um, these are the most relevant actions for how a request happens. So when a request happens, whether it's a read or a write, if it's on a partition or a device above the device, there will be a remap event um, that will say from what origin sector and offset did it come from and then what map origin sector is it mapping to. If there's multiple of them, there will be a chain of them, perhaps to say if it's a logical volume on top of a partition on top of a device. And then after, if, after any potential remaps, the uh, request is queued. There is a get request, struct, struct request allocated. These are all things before the request is inserted into the queue, into the, any, it could be multi-queues. For the Linux kernel, 5.0 and after is definitely multi-queue. And then the earlier ones before, it depends on the device type. Um, so the request is inserted into the queue, dispatched or issued to the driver, and then completed. That's the one where you know that I.O. completed. And you'll see a status code as to whether that request succeeded or failed. And for BIO-based devices, you'll see less of these events, AQC. So this progression of, of uh, actions is usually what you want to see for, the, uh, for a single request, AQGIDC. It makes it easier um, to memorize sort of that progression of actions because that's a standard progression of uh, looking at a uh, at a block trace. Um, so I have some quick real world examples of uh, let's see. So that's what a short, relatively short block trace looks like. Um, and so you'll see multiple events happening, um, and you may see some events in between happening. Yes. So you'll see AQG IDC for 22,400,3200. Keep in mind, you may see other sectors, uh, other sector locations that you leave in between because there may be multiple requests happening at one specific time. Um, and you may have to search for things. Uh, you may have gigabytes of trace data. You'll want to find one specific event. So that you can use for, you can use tools like grep to search for a specific block address. Um, so the uh, RWBS category, those are the operation flags. Classically, it was read, write, barrier, sync. But after uh, kernel 2637, um, long ago now, because we're up to 5.2 now, uh, the block barriers are replaced with flush and FUA, which uh, flush allows the entire device to be flushed and for all writes before to be satisfied. FUA is force unit access. That means that is a specific request can request to write directly to the device, not go through any cache. This is commonly used by file systems to directly write metadata and be sure that it's getting written directly to the media, not being cached, just in case there's a crash in between, so it can write as soon as it can to the medium. And those get higher priority than regular writes, um, and those take more, more strenuous to do than regular writes because they can't really go through the cache. Um, but mostly they're time critical because they want you want to be on, written on as soon as you can. So afterwards, the order in which you see the events are, if it's a flush, that F will be at the beginning, and then it will be one of either discard, write, or read. And if it's neither of those, then you'll see an, a capital N. But that's only for driver plugging and unplugging. Um, and then after the read, write, or discard, you'll see force unit access F, read ahead A, synchronous S, or metadata M. Metadata is a very new uh, flag that's um, within the last 
two years, I think. I forget the exact version it's in, but that's uh, newer, newer than the other three. And so the caveat to block trace, as I said, it's possible for multiple IOs to be performed on one storage device at any time. So be ready to pipe the output of block powers to less or pipe it to a text file, search through it, grep through it. I've, I had a test where I was doing a 16 gigabyte block trace file um, and that's, that's quite a lot to, you definitely want to pipe that to some file <laughs> before reading through it. And high volume trace run, runs should save on some kind of separate storage that is ideally not the test device and fast enough to handle the I.O. The demands are not that bad, but when you block trace, there'll be a report at the end that'll say how many events it drops. Um, and if that's non-zero, then you, you need, to, need to either get a faster device or adjust the buffer settings of block trace, which are relatively easy. Um, and one other caveat, in the block trace, you'll see that the timer starts on the uh, first event. The first event says zero for the timer. And that's, um, that is not the time that you started block trace. That is actually the time of the first I.O. So that's actually, that can be good or bad depending on what you want the, uh, the time index to be. Most of the time you want the time index to be the first I.O., but if you want it to be synchronized to a specific time that you may have to coordinate that and adjust uh, relative, find out when the actual request is being submitted. Um, so, so the remaps, the A uh, records for the, uh, the the block trace, you'll actually see the remaps can occur from either a partition, which you'll see from some sub device, in, in this case it's a SCSI 8-2 uh, dev SDA2. You'll see right here there's a uh, record for 82 sector 22190300. And so if you look from the top to the bottom, you'll see the sector progressions from top to bottom. And you can actually see that A record for 3800, that's actually for the device below, not for 80. But you can trace from top to bottom for the, uh, the actual record. But the, the partition, or in this case the device mapper, uh, the LVM logical volume 2530, that block number is what you'll want to look at for your application using that specific device. So keep in mind the, uh, the device stack, whether you have a partition and then a logical volume on that partition. And write down the, uh, the major and minor devices for each device. And so while writing data, the scheduler can actually merge I.O. Uh, together to make one larger I.O. for, uh, say, an I.O. bound device uh, to get better performance. And so the most common I.O. operation is a back merge where you have, say, a right to block 57520, lots of numbers there. But say you have like block 0 and then block 8 and then block 16, the scheduler can actually merge the one back with the other one, like if there's two 4 kilobyte writes to create an 8 kilobyte write. And then if there's another write that's coming in, it can merge that one adjacent to it to make a longer sequential write. And so you'll see a progression of AQG, AQM, AQM, on and on, AQM, AQM. And then it inserted into the queue and then eventually completed. And you'll see a larger uh, sector count at the end. So in this example, it's 11 4 kilobyte write requests being merged into one 88 sector request, 45,056 bytes. And so if you see, you will not see a one-to-one -one correlation between the A and Q events and the completion because the schedule is merging them together. And there's another uh, other uh, behavior that can happen. It's called splits. So this happens if there is a device that has an optimal I.O. size that's um, non-zero, say it's four kilobytes. The, the scheduler will have to split that I.O into multiple parts. And you'll see an X record for that with um, a start and an end sector number 
at the end separated by a slash. And so each of those will have an individual completion record. I have the first one here, there are other ones afterwards. And so um, IO errors. This is actually very interesting because since the completion uh, event has an IO error code at the end, you can find when a device fails. So in this simple test, we have a uh, device called SCSI debug, which has an option X0, X2 to enable failures on a specific sector. Um, and so that created a device dev SDB, which then I created an, a, a uh, command to write um, 4656. The, uh, the, uh, the sector that fails is 0x1234 for 10 sectors. And so when it tries to write it, DD reports the error, no data available. And you can see it here, it says 65475, which would be minus 61. And if you look in the error no dot H header, you can see 61, no data available, E no data. So during a trace, if you have a completion uh, trace event that's non-zero for the status code, that may indicate that there was an error somewhere. But usually you're coming from the other way around where you'll see your application reports some kind of error like Usually it will be EIO, IO error, uh, ENO data for this specific driver. And so then you can find that specific event and when it happened. And there's an extra option in, um, see I didn't list the command here, it's dash T, block parse dash T, which will let you track IO latency. And after the sector offset plus length, in this case 0 plus 8, there's an extra field in parentheses that is the latency in nanoseconds between each of the stages. The, for the I record, it's delta since G, the get request. For the D record dispatch, it's the delta since the insertion into Q. And for C, it's the completion latency since being dispatched into the Q. So you can see here 32,000 microseconds or 32,000 nanoseconds, 32.8 microseconds. And this is a uh, three, 3 cross point NVMe solid state drive, which I expect to have that kind of latency, very low latency. Uh, and you can actually take this data and you can graph it. So if you filter on just those C records and then look at the first ones, you can see these fields with parentheses, um, and then filter it out with some more, um, there it is, TR, awk, and then I'm listing the first five ones. You can create an XY graph with the time of the trace and then the latency of the I.O. And then save it into a text file and then import it into a graphing program and then create a latency graph like this. So this is not just some average or percentile, like 99th percentile. You can actually see patterns here where you can see bursts of latency on specific runs. And then you can see the latency go down. You can see time intervals on the drive of the specific I.O. pattern. That could actually indicate things like a drive's microcontroller behavior, or if you see some strange periodic latency behavior or a strange 99th percentile high latency reading in FIO that might be related to some kind of time related pattern. And this makes it a lot easier to look at thousands or millions of data points. And there's another program called IO Watcher, which um, can create a, gra a graph or a video of IO activity from block trace data. And so it gives reads and writes, um, locations of reads and writes, throughput and latency. Um, and I have an example here in, let's see, in this. So this is a, uh, I.O. watch a run of a video volume uh, that's writing to specific areas. And during this activity, you can actually see writes in blue and 
right here is the first sector of the device, sector zero, which then chases to the right and then goes up one line in a raster fashion all the way to the end of the device at the top right. So the right activity we can see here, we have the UDS index writing sequentially. We have data slabs writing here. There's a, uh, let's see, that's the slab summary, not the slab summary. Um, slab journal, reference counts. Slab journal, yes, that's a tiny, a smaller slab journal. Each of the slabs, I believe, in this video volume is two gigabytes, the default setting. And then at the very top is a circular log called the uh, recovery journal. And so when this is played, you can see behind here the block map is writing in what looks like a checkerboard pattern. That's actually a radix tree that's spaced out by... Uh, a certain interval, and it's filling uh, with a sequential write, and then those same blocks are being written by a random overwrite. And you can see a large burst of activity across a very large area, and I know this ahead of time. That's actually something called the block map period, where it's updating the entire block map. Um, so you can look at large-scale patterns. This would have required... Um, I forget how big this trace file was, but it probably would have been millions of trace events. And instead of trying to correlate those numbers in text as they are, you can visually represent them in a compressed time. Um, and you can start to associate patterns, look at things like QDEP and throughput. Um, and IO Watcher actually has, um, I want to try and contribute to IO Watcher to fix a few bugs here and there. There was actually one of these videos, I think it might have been, it wasn't this one, but it was one about the same size. It was a 16 gigabyte set of block trace data. It originally took 12 hours to build, to build a video. It uses um, Aug Theora and SVGA, part of SVG, PNG to SVG, to, to create the graphs. It's multiple SVG graphs that are then rasterized and then put into an Aug Theora video. And it originally took 12 hours to compile, but then after a bug fix, it was put to 10 minutes. It was because of various changes in the block trace data. Um, I believe it was, it doesn't count Q events. But these are the kinds of scale issues that happen with building the video when there are so many events um, that occur. So that's IO Watcher. Um, it's a very interesting tool. It was originally... There's an older one called Seek Watcher that was Python. Uh, this one, uh, IO Watcher is C++, I believe. Uh, I believe it's Chris Mason um, who uh, built it originally. So there's other block trace related programs that come along in the block trace repository and in the block trace package. Btrace is performing live tracing for block devices. It's a shortcut to running block trace to standard out, and then running block parse using standard in. Um, there are some caveats to doing that. You, you can live trace, but I would not recommend doing it for heavy, um, heavy loads, because there may be some time discontinuities or dropped events because of, uh, instead of buffering to a, a storage device for, for the test files, you're putting to standard out and then standard in. There may be issues. Most of the time, You'll want to trace, you don't really, the priority is more to have the, uh, the log data stable than it is to see it live. Um, so you can try B-Trace, but I recommend using regular block trace to a file for most testing purposes. And then there's some other utilities, verify block parse for verifying the time ordering of output from block parse, which is not necessarily guaranteed for some runs. Um, most of the time, I believe, for file output, it's consistent. I've encountered some areas where it's not. For graphing, that's why I usually use the time value in the event to graph. And then there's uh, some programs called BT Record and Replay, where you can actually replay the I.O. activity as captured by block trace. Um, I get to try and use those sometime. They're not going to have the data, because block trace preserves the time, what time, type of operation, and the sector offset, but it doesn't know what the data is. That would take far too much data, you know, space to save what the data was in the block. Um, 
and <clears throat> BTT lets you analyze block IO traces produced by block trace for various statistics. Um, it's another accessory program. So, in summary, block trace and block parse are the lowest level programs for block devices to find out what's going on. And it's expressed in a relatively easy to parse text format. It looks very intimidating, but it's very, very grepable. You can use grep, set, and awk to process the basic text events. You can export it to other formats. You can export it to graphing programs. There are other programs that can do filtering. And there's a new patch to block parse that can filter by events internally in the program. So you don't have to do grep, set, and awk. And large amounts can be analyzed. It all depends on how much space do you have, how much time, processing time, um, but it's relatively easy. So, any questions? Yes. Okay, yeah. So the question was, in relation to performance, is this sort of system level or, um, so it's, this is the lowest level you can analyze at. What is going on at each individual sector? Um, it may be looking at a microscope at the tree instead of looking at the forest. So. There may be other tools where uh, you'll want to look at, if it's a general performance problem, you may want to try and look at block trace if it's happening on specific sectors. That's actually happened before with um, a case that I have once where a customer had multiple devices in, concatenated in an LVM logical volume, and they were wondering why the uh, part at the end was slow. And they knew that the first device was, was a slower device, but that actually turned out that that device was at the end. And we could see that with uh, Block Trace would have seen it with the, um, the latency, the, the latency times error. Though there was another uh, tool called DM Stats for device mapper stats where you can actually look at specific regions and get a, uh, a histogram of um, the latency or the throughput for that specific region and not the entire device. So it's, you'll want to ch use a specific tool based on what granularity you're looking at. And block trace is the lowest granularity. It's by sector. And then to get those, to aggregate those stats, you'll need to do, um, take averages of those numbers, which other existing tools do. But then in this case, if you're looking at specific I.O. from specific programs or I.O. at specific regions or flush or FUA sort of activity, then you'll want to, you'll want to catch those flags and watch that specific behavior. So it all depends. Um, you'll know the context. You'll have a good hint at the context as far as how, what level of detail you want to check. Like if it's for the whole device, then you could use I.O. stat for that kind of thing. But then if you, you could simulate the, the I.O. with FIO and then use its histogram reading for that. Or you could use DM stats if it's a device mapper device. And then you can have histograms printed out by that. So I hope that helps, though. Any other questions? Wrong with it. Thank you.